The Offer, Chapter 3, The Secret Ending. So that trailer is the first part of this journey, right? It's a call to action. It's a recruitment. It's a why do we care about this thing, right? Because there is a secret history out there, and we're going to talk about it. So first, let's talk about the podcast, those of you that listen to it. Episode one visited two clockmakers, one rescuing the other from prison. I won't get too into it, but at the end, what do we find out? We find out that there is this secret clock design out there. One character talks to the other and says, hey, I keep hearing this story, Joseph Ives, this master clockmaker, telling me he's got the secret design. If we can just put it into production, it's going to make us a whole lot of money. But no one knows where this design is. But he told me this story about, you know, going with Gideon Roberts, the master clockmaker, and took him back to the woodshed, and he saw this clock in the corner, and it wasn't really looking like a clock, and, and this, that, and the other, and that's it. And the guy said, woodshed? What about this woodshed? And the minute... One character told the other this key word. The first character knew instantly where this clock design was located. And so the secret ending is not as long as the podcast episodes or chapters one and two, but here is that secret ending. So sitting on the porch of the Abel Lewis Tavern, we have John Burge, the investor, and Titus Merriman, Bristol's doctor, and also investor. And the two are trying to figure out how to make a clock that can make them all the money they need to do to accomplish their goals in life. And each one has different goals. The clockmaker, Joseph Ives, he wants to make clocks because it's his passion. The uh, investor, John Burge, wants to make clocks because it gives him a legacy. And of course, Titus Merriman wants to make clocks so it can build his community, more jobs, and maybe one day a hospital. But only one of them has secret access to that community. So think about it. You've got a law a community of 1830, colonial times, right? Folks are, are, by their nature, private, and as Titus Merriman said himself, Bristol is a competitive town, which encourages what? Secret making and secret breaking. So if you do have a secret in Bristol, how is it that you would keep it in 1830? You couldn't lock it up, right? You had to keep it someplace that was accessible, number one, if you're going to use that secret, but also kind of hidden, maybe hidden in plain view or hidden in, in privacy. So the secret ending here is that Titus Merriman tells John Burge that in all of his travels, of all of his visiting of patients in the Bristol community, he is a rare person of a profession that is invited into people's homes. Now, if you had something you wanted out of public view, keep it in your house, right? Safer than in a store. There weren't many banks or anything like that back then. So here we have a character, Titus Merriman, who's a doctor who's able to be invited by invitation into people's homes. And being a doctor, he's there at bad times. And oftentimes, he's invited into spaces that are considered private to help the people in those homes. So Titus tells John, one time, I went to help a family in Bristol. And they couldn't pay me money because there wasn't money back then. It was very rare, right? You had to trade and barter. And we talked about that in, in the last event, about the system of bartering that kept local economies going. So in exchange for doctor services, he was allowed to choose a book from that person's library. Now, libraries back then, was it a building like this? No, it was a personal collection. Books were rare. Books were actually very expensive. And you didn't loan your books to just anyone because they could come back torn and fragment. I mean, you just couldn't protect paper back then like you could now. So in exchange for services, Titus Merriam was allowed to borrow a book. And what he noticed in this book, when he was reading it by the fireside later, at a later time, he noticed something in that book that stood out to him. And he tells John Burge this. He says, John, this book that I was allowed to borrow, in the back, on one of the pages, had a hand-drawn design. And I didn't think anything of it because people didn't have access to a lot of paper, right? They had to maybe use it if they wanted to squiggle something or make notes. And so it wasn't unusual to have a book of, of official history or, or, or even uh, mathematics and have something scribbled on the back. But what he said after that was that 
But the thing that stuck out to me is that this design, this image, this picture, at the top was written one word, woodshed. And I said, why would someone draw something in the back, write woodshed on top, and then have a picture that wasn't a woodshed? It wasn't a map. It wasn't anything. What was it? And as he begins to describe to John what he saw, I remember it looked like a clock design hidden in a book on the back page that someone had drawn and purposely put in a book that had no relation to clock design so they could, one, reference it, and two, hide it. And it's only after John Burge mentions the word woodshed that Titus Marion remembers that last part of that book, that very unique design drawing, and the person who gave him that book. To be continued on the next Bristol podcast episode. Join the next adventure of Bristol, the quest, by subscribing to one of our social media channels at www.bristol.com, B-R-X-S-T-O-L.com, and ready yourself for the next story, the next clue, and ultimately, the final revelation. Thank you.